Hello and welcome to Premier League All Access with me, Sam Matterface, Talk Sports Chief Football Correspondent Alex Crook and international football expert Kevin Hatchard. We've got loads to get through on the show this week. So here's what's coming up. He's made a mistake, Doku, and it's, it's, a, it's a forwards mistake when you're trying to defend a set piece. I can't believe that VAR haven't intervened. It's a failure of the system. It's a title game between two, you know, massive clubs. It's gone right to the wire. It's in the final seconds and you have a huge contentious decision. You have a monitor standing right there at the sideline. Man alive, just send him to it. With Arsenal playing Manchester City in a couple of weeks' time, it's theirs to lose. If Havertz gets sent off, he can have no complaints because I, I do think it's a dive. I, I think it's a dive, right? I think it's a dive. But I can understand why the referee doesn't give it. Maybe Villa froze knowing that this was probably their key game of the season. If they won this, I think they probably felt as if Champions League was almost theirs. Son, if you look at his data over the last few years, there is not as good a finisher in world football as him. So I thought that was a real vindication of everything that Postacoglu has done with that club. Hello both, are we well? Really well, really well, good. Exciting weekend of action in Germany and England, very good. Saw Harry Kane make a bit more history, seems to do that every week. So yeah, another good weekend in the books. Yes, I did notice that. They went gold crazy, didn't they, Bayern Munich, about time too. Um, it wasn't gold crazy at uh, Liverpool's Anfield Stadium yesterday, but uh, it was a little bit chaotic, wasn't it, Crook? And it sounded like a, a fantastic afternoon for you boys there. I was watching it uh, from the comforts uh, of my uh, little studio and I could not believe um, how many chances Liverpool had to win it but didn't take. Yeah, it was chaotic. It was a game that was played at a breakneck speed. I was lucky actually this weekend because I was at two fantastic matches, probably for different reasons, but Bournemouth, Sheffield United, 45 shots between them. That was fantastic as well. Wow. And then, yeah, Liverpool, Man City, it was a privilege to be there, if it's ever a privilege for me to be at Anfield. <laughs> I don't think they felt the same way. Uh, let's get into it. Crook, it's nice to see, by the way, that you're not in Portugal. Did you go to Portugal last week? Because I, I didn't hear that you did. I mean... I mean, you, some, someone kept mentioning something about Portugal on the last podcast, I'm sure. I had so many messages of people saying, as, as Crook updated us on his current location. Do you want to update us on your current location now that you're not in Portugal? <laughs> yeah, I've gone from sunny Portugal to uh, wet West Sussex. So uh, the, the, the tan, I'm sure, will fade pretty quickly. There's a tan? Um, <laughs> right. A little bit of colour. <laughs> Uh, it's advantage Arsenal in the title race, Kev, isn't it? Because uh, they managed to go top on Saturday thanks to a controversial win over uh, Brentford at home. And the two big heavyweights that were the top two before we went into the weekend are uh, slugged out a draw up at Anfield. So it means now with Arsenal playing Manchester City in a couple of weeks' time, it's theirs to lose. I think to an extent, I think... It's interesting, isn't it? Because that draw obviously helped Arsenal. But I think what it also did is it underlined the quality of both teams. I thought Liverpool-Manchester City was a sensational game. An amazing, uh, you know, symbol of what they've achieved in the last few years, actually. Because you had City at times playing with great control, great threat. Liverpool playing with that amazing intensity that not many other teams are able to match. And so if you're Arsenal looking at that, you're thinking, oh, we've got to finish above both of these teams. But you have to credit Arsenal for the the form they've found since Dubai. I mean, that is an, an extraordinary run of results because before that winter break for them, they did look as though they were losing momentum and were probably going to drop out the race. So I have to tip my hat to them. I think they've been sensational and shown real grit and determination as well. Yeah, what did Mikel Arteta do in Dubai? But it certainly <laughs> has worked, whatever it is that he did. Um, I was at Bramall Lane on Monday night to watch them demolish Sheffield United. I watched that game between Arsenal and Brentford on Saturday evening as well. And I thought for the large part, they probably should have had more goals than they did. Then they got into that sticky situation that sometimes Arsenal got themselves in, but they always find a way. We'll get to the Arsenal game in just a second because there was a big controversial decision in that match. There was a controversial decision right at the end of Liverpool-Manchester City as well. And when I saw it, I thought penalty. This is Jeremy Doku, who had his foot higher than a kite into the chest of Alexis McAllister. Now, anywhere else on the pitch, that's going to be a foul. I think... 
you know, we all know it doesn't matter if you contact the ball. If you strike an opponent with your foot and it's that high, usually a foul is given. So why didn't the referee give a penalty? And why didn't the VAR then overturn his decision and say, I think you better look at this again? Crook, you were there. What was the feeling from everybody in the press box? Well, I call penalty straight away on air. I can't believe that VAR haven't intervened. I know the official explanation from the PGMOL is that Doku made contact with the ball. Maybe he did. I'm, I'm not convinced by that. But what's but that did, got to do anything? Well, he's, he's kicked through it and he's caught the player. So, as you say, it's, it's irrelevant. Michael Oliver probably didn't have the best of views. And I think he'll be frustrated on this Monday morning that he wasn't called over to the monitor because I think if he was, it's a penalty. I thought Jurgen Klopp was quite circumspect about it after the game. He said, look, we all know it was a penalty. doesn't matter if we get an apology from Howard Webb or if we get an explanation as to why it wasn't given. It doesn't change the result. But it could well change the outcome of the Premier League title race because that could be a huge moment come the end of the season. I can't understand how it's not given. I think it's a clear-cut decision. If you're watching that at Stockley Park, you've got to call the referees the monitor. He's made a mistake, Doku, and it's it's a it's a forwards mistake when you're trying to defend a set piece. He's let the ball bounce, and yeah. therefore he's lost control at that stage, and that's why he catches him. Kevin, that explanation baffles me, because if you were in the penalty area and you did an overhead kick in a crowded box with loads of other defending players yeah. around you... And you caught the ball and then went through and caught somebody else. The referee would blow the whistle and give a foul because he would suggest that you were endangering the safety of an opponent. It has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that you've played the ball. And the defence I've played the ball hasn't been in law for about 30 years. I, I, I actually am I'm even more baffled now that they've said that than I was when I first saw the decision in the first place. I, I, I can't get my head around that. Yeah, it's a penalty, I, I think, simple as. And I can understand, you know, they were talking on, you know, some of the TV analysis about, well, naturally, there's this unwritten rule in football where if it's in the box, it has to be a higher standard. I, it's just not applicable in law. It's just not It's just not the case or shouldn't be the case. And I think Michael Oliver, if he's referred to the monitor, I think gives it. I think he does. And I think, therefore, mm. it's a failure of the system. Because the whole point of this, ultimately, I know we talk about high bars and, you know, various criteria for sending the ref to the monitor. It's a title game between two, you know, massive clubs. It's gone right to the wire. It's in the final seconds and you have a huge contentious decision. You have a monitor standing right there at the sideline. <laughs> Man alive, just send him to it. And then if he looks at it and goes, do you know what? I don't think there's enough there. I think he takes the ball. Then at least you've sold the decision and you know it's the ref's decision. I know he's made the first judgment, but what is it there for if he can't go and have a second look at a very contentious decision? I agree with you guys. It's an open soul in his chest. It's a foul. It just is. His His boot is so high. So I think even if he gets a tickle on the ball first, for me, that's irrelevant. I think it's a penalty. That's the key thing, isn't it? Is that it's the it's the height of the leg because if you were, we're we're all told that anywhere near that region is is an immediate foul anywhere else on the pitch. So I don't understand how on earth that that is not applicable just because it's in the penalty area. And well, also the other thing is, it's like you say about the failure of the system. The idea of the system is to pick up any of these clear and obvious errors. And I actually agree with Jurgen Klopp when he says, you know, if you don't think that's clear and obvious, what have yeah. you had for lunch? But the other thing as well is if you've got, let's say you've got a challenge on halfway, right? And somebody takes the ball first, but on the follow through, they catch somebody on the knee or they catch somebody on the shin or what have you. We've seen players, even though they've got the ball first, sent off for that kind of thing. I'm not suggesting Doku should be sent off, but my point is no. you take the ball first, fine. But if you then catch somebody on the follow through then you do get penalised for it. We see that all the time. We've seen players sent off for it. I, I think we have got a little bit stuck with that situation now where, you know, we talk about handball and nobody's quite sure what a handball is and all that stuff. I think now we're a little bit stuck with when a player gets caught on a follow through, what's the procedure? Because it okay, seems Kevin, to change all the time. 
we can't get stuck on so many of these issues. That 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 is that is a recipe for absolute disaster. But that's where we're at. Handball, I think that's where we're at. Is already a disaster. I mean, yeah. I was doing the the Freiburg versus West Ham game the other day. You know, they sent the referee to the monitor, and he still made the wrong decision. You know, it was a crazy situation and people could say well that handball in particular wasn't a handball because he didn't mean it and his hands you know where was he supposed to go I don't care about that because I don't judge it on what I want the law to be I know yes. that the law is a little bit iffy exactly I judge exactly. it I judge the referee's performance on what the law actually is because that's all you can do right because otherwise it's not fair on them we have to play the game to the rules that we're given even if we don't like the the, 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 the rules so I, I was so surprised that that situation wasn't rectified. But then it sort of dawned on me, and I think everyone's accepted it, no one really knows what a handball is inside the penalty area anymore. And I think we, if we get to that situation with challenges, we've got a massive problem with the game. Because how, how, if we can't determine what is right and what is wrong, even if we've got a 300-page law book uh, and, and the app in front of us that takes us through 27 scenarios, yet we can't make a consistent decision, then the laws are wrong. Someone's got to step in and, and clarify them and clarify them very quickly. Um, that is a, a huge, huge issue. But I, I think I'll go back to the game just for a second, Crook, and, and, and I'll suggest this and you tell me if I'm wrong or not. I think Liverpool should have won it. I thought they were the better yeah. team, especially in the second half. Yeah, I thought it was a really brave performance from Liverpool, especially coming from behind and some of their young players really stood out, particularly I thought Jarrell Quanta at the back. I spoke to him after the game. He speaks as, as well as he plays. He is going to be uh, one heck of a talent. And he said he was living out his boyhood dream by, by getting the opportunity to play in such massive matches. I've not seen Man City ever, I don't think, under Pep Guardiola in a situation where they're hanging on as much as they were in that second half and, and playing for time at the end and taking off flair players. Obviously, KDB didn't react too well to being substituted, but that was all about just trying to slow the game down, take yes. the tempo out of it, get control of the ball. And, and they did that to a certain extent, but you're right about those missed opportunities. I thought Luis Diaz was terrific until he got in front yeah. of goal and mm. obviously he fluffed his lines on a few occasions. I don't think Darwin Nunez played particularly well. Um, in comparison, but they have more than enough chances to, to win the game. And at the end of it, just speaking of Pep Guardiola and, and seeing the body language of the Man City players in the tunnel afterwards, I think they were quite relieved to come away with a point. Yeah, I think you're right. And uh, I think that decision to take off Kevin De Bruyne probably didn't go down too well with the Belgian. But when I was watching the game, all I could think of it, he's trying to take a sting out of this. Because then what happened was when Kovacic came onto the field, they just kept the ball. They didn't really even try to force the issue to try and get a goal. They just tried to keep the ball. In fact, there was a couple of times they got up to the edge of the penalty area, turned and came back again because they wanted just to slow the match down and take the sting out of it. Because as you say, once if you get into a slugging match with Liverpool, they're faster on transition than you. And I think we saw that yesterday. You know, Man City in comparison, when they break, they don't break anywhere near as quickly. They haven't got the, the raw pace of, of Liverpool, not in collectively. You know, maybe Haaland, you know, obviously big swashbuckling. He can bluster through or whatever. That was an interesting matchup, wasn't it, between him and Van Dijk. Um, but, um, but I just think that Liverpool have got so much in terms of transition that that's why he did that and tried to slow it down because he didn't want to, he knew that game would get away from him if it stayed in that pattern. It's interesting you mentioned the battle between Van Dijk and Haaland. Van Dijk has come out on top for me and Haaland actually didn't really make any kind of contribution at all in the second half. There was one moment when I think Haaland realised that his race was run and it was when there was, was a foot race between Van Dijk and Haaland and it reminded me a little bit of uh, the Gold Cup a few years ago, Corto Starr and Denman coming up the Cheltenham Hill. It's, it's topical because it's Cheltenham week. I tell you what, two athletes just pounding their way up the pitch. But Van Dijk got the better of that particular duel and Haaland went missing after that. I think it was difficult for them to get quality service to Haaland as well. Uh, you know, I think you're right. I think Van Dijk and Quanstead did a brilliant job. But I think the energy with which Liverpool played, Harvey Elliott, a bit further forward first, was brought back a bit later on. I thought the way he pressed was sensational. The energy as a unit, it, it just really made it difficult for City to breathe in the game. And Sam's absolutely right. That decision to bring Kovacic on was purely somebody who has that bit of pauser, as as Guardiola would call it, that ability to just take a second, put your foot on the ball, try and slow things down because Liverpool swarmed them in that second half. I, I, I thought City started the game superbly. 
But first 15 minutes, I thought they were outrageously good. Uh, and I thought from a Liverpool point of view, this could be a really long afternoon. But the way Liverpool battled back into it and started to really disrupt them, I thought was excellent. I thought as well, he, he won't get a lot of praise, I don't think. But Stefan Ortega, having come on for Edison in... In the maelstrom, I thought did a yeah. really good job. I thought his distribution as a goalkeeper was excellent, made some really important saves, was quite calm. You know, he must have been feeling a bit jittery because he hasn't played too many games of that stature. I thought he was excellent. Uh, a quick word for one other player who never gets any sort of praise whatsoever apart from on this podcast, Wataru Endo. Excellent. Absolutely excellent. Let's move on now uh, to the Emirates and to the league leaders. Well, for now, anyway. Well, a totally different performance uh, for Arsenal from that in which they slapped up Sheffield United on Monday night. Uh, 31 goals and seven league wins since the start of 2024, showing real dominance. However, they needed to dig deep to secure the points here. Should Kai Havertz have been on the pitch, Alex? Well, we all know the answer. Uh, Ian Wright said it on television on uh, Saturday night and you can't get a more Arsenal blinkered pundit than Wrighty we know he shouldn't have been on the pitch this again I, I, I said it during the Sunday session I, I don't think this is necessarily a problem with the referee I think it's a problem with the laws and the way that we're allowed to use VAR because again the referee clearly hasn't got a clear view of the fact that he's dived in the penalty area VAR can't intervene because it's a second yellow card offence not a red and I think that's a nonsense I think it's something that David Ellery needs to look at. If you get something as clear-cut as that, why on earth, if you've got the technology, can't you use it and just have the VAR official just say in the ear of the referee, you need to look at that. I think he's dying. But think of the yellow. delays if you have that yeah. every five oh. minutes. That's the problem. You know, you're gonna Maybe there needs to be a threshold. That. Maybe, but then again, you get, you're making it subjective and that's the issue, isn't it? I mean, the problem here is, is you're putting more and more layers of subjectivity into the mind of the referee, which is why I think we're in the situation that we are because you've got so many decision makers now that everybody's got a different opinion and you don't ever get a consensus of opinion. Therefore, you end up with this baffling situation where you don't know what is what. I actually don't think he should have been sent off and I'll tell you why. I don't think the first one's that much of a yellow card Mm. and the second one, I can see that actually when you're running, I, I think it's a dive, right? I think it's a dive. But I can understand why the referee doesn't give it and I can even understand why the assistant doesn't give it because the angles that they've got they can't possibly see 100% certain, 100% that that is a dive. Also, let's go back to a couple of other decisions that are actually quite big. And I think this is huge. Leandro Trossard was basically ru- wrestled to the floor round his throat by Matthias Jensen, I think it was. Pulled to yeah. the floor. Now, how on earth is that not a penalty? That's clear and obvious and pretty Pretty, pretty quickly, you can see once you've seen the replay, that should have been a penalty. So all this nonsense about Kai Havertz should have been sent off and if he hadn't have been, then it would have been, uh, it would have been 1-1. Well, no, actually, if the referee and the linesman and the VAR had done their job in the first place, they would have had a penalty. And it would have been, I think it would, at that point, it would have been 2-0 and the game would have been over. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think as well, that, that, look, if Havertz gets sent off, he can have no complaints because I, I do think it's a dive. And this is me criticising Kai Havertz. Imagine that. Are you all right? Uh, Are you okay? Yeah, I, I'm having palpitations, but I'll get through it. But I, I, but we'll talk about the way he bounced back in a bit. But look, I, I think there, there's two mistakes there. I'm surprised that between them, the referee and the assistant maybe haven't given that and, and not seen the angle. But I, I think Brentford can't have too many complaints. I thought they were a lot more solid than usual. Actually, we've criticised their defending a lot in recent weeks, but they managed to dig in. But I think it's actually a huge, it's actually a more impressive win for Arsenal than some of these six nils and five nils and what have you. It's actually much more impressive because they were up against determined opponents, physical opponents. And the thing about Arsenal has been in recent years, have they got the grit and determination? Can they actually rise to the challenge physically? And in these tough games, find the extra mile. And they did. They, They absolutely did that. So I think this, To win this, even after Ramsdale's hideous mistake, uh, he bounced back with two brilliant saves, I thought. Uh, I thought the first one from Tony, considering there's no way he can expect that, Tony to go for goal from range in that way, the adjustment to tip that over the top is is outrageously good. Okay, well, let's let's talk about that. So, Crook, would you like to uh, place your microphone down and put both your fingers in your ears at this point um, (laughs) so that you don't get offended by by what we're going to say about your best mate. Um, 
But um, he does have this tendency to hold on to the ball for just a little bit too long when he's about to kick. It's not the first time that we've seen something of a similar ilk happen with Aaron Ramsdale, which is a little bit of a, uh, a concern. However, I do think his stops were sensational. And as you say, that Tony one was was absolutely exquisite. Um, look, what, what what do we do with, with, with Brentford here? They've lost seven of their last eight Premier League away games. Their form since November has been pretty poor. Th- there's not much you can say in defence of them, apart from some of the performances have not been as bad as the results. But a bit like Everton... If the results don't come, eventually you are going to find yourself in trouble. And Brentford have got into that sort of rut where if they don't get out of it soon, they're going to get sucked in. Yeah, they've been really unlucky with injuries, although you can say that about a lot of teams in the Premier League this season. But I do think Rico Henry has been a massive loss for them. But I think at the end of the season, ultimately, they will count themselves fortunate, Brentford, that certainly two of the teams who came out from the Championship are so dreadful. And and listen, for all the plaudits that we've given Luton, they haven't really put enough wins on the board to really put pressure uh, on the bees either. So I, I think they're going to be quite grateful for that. Ooh, I think yet, it'll be interesting. Yet, yet, yeah, big, yet. big game Wednesday. Ten, game, I, I, ten I games you to fancy, go. Don't get excited. L- well, I know you fancy Luton on Wednesday. I don't, and I think actually if they lose to Bournemouth, then that that could be quite terminal for them. Um, but in terms of Brentford, I think the big question now is what they do about Thomas Frank because we know that Matthew Benham has put the club up for sale. He needs them to be a Premier League club to get maximum value. And for all the good work that Thomas Frank has done, there aren't too many managers who survive a run of defeats like this in the Premier League. No, um, but I do think he's a good manager and I do think the way he carries himself is pretty impressive. So I think it would be negligent to get rid of him just on the pure basis of results when there are other circumstances. I think you sell Tony, you probably sell one or two of the others as well, make some dosh, rebuild the squad and go again. I think that's what they'll do next season. And I wouldn't be too surprised if they do it and do it well, because that's what they are very, very good at, Kev. Yeah, and I think the thing with Thomas Frank is he's a developer of talent. You know, he says this himself, that he th- feels that his greatest strength is to, to develop players. You're going to need that to happen, because if you're going to try and rebuild the squad with the Tony Cash, with some other sales, he's absolutely the man to do it. If anybody should have credit in the bank, it's him. I think he has been unlucky with injury. I, I don't think the defensive unit and the goalkeeper have been right all season. I, I think Mark Fleck, and I watched him a lot in the Bundesliga, not he's an enough. okay goalkeeper, but I think he's quite average. He's nowhere near as good as David Raya. And so I think that's been maybe a bit of a misstep in terms of their recruitment. Nathan Collins has really struggled. Uh, mm. He's made some high-profile errors, and I think his confidence has been shot to pieces. And, you know, they've had so many injuries in that area. Crook is absolutely spot on about Rico Henry. I think they've really, really missed him. And so it's really difficult then if you're about being physical and well organised. If you haven't got the same lineup defensively and your goalkeeper's not up to snuff, you're going to really struggle. And I think that's why they have. So if they survive, which I expect them to, I think it'd be crazy to get rid of Thomas Frank. Absolutely crazy. And I don't think they will. OK, uh, well, there's no doubt that Thomas Frank has got credit in the bank. But is Eric Ten Hag running out of currency? We'll start with Aston Villa, nil, Spurs, four. Villa's three-game winning run ended by Spurs and total domination from Spurs as well. This was a very surprising outcome for me. I think maybe Villa froze knowing that this was probably their key game of the season. If they won this, I think they probably felt as if Champions League was almost theirs. Now, they've got a fight on their hands and a big one. They got overly emotional. Um, you know, John McGinn exemplified that talk before the match about how season defining this could be. And I think they got swept up in it. They made mistakes. I thought the goal they conceded for the opener when the you know the defence were far too high up the pitch was a mm. poor one. And and then McGinn the second goal. at two at two nil down, that they're not out the game. He makes a ridiculous challenge, rush of blood to the head. It's, a, it's an easy decision for the referee, it's a clear red card. And there goes their chance of getting anything from the match. And this is one of their leaders, one of their senior players. And and my pet hate came to the fore as well because he does that, a moronic challenge that lets his team down and he gets applauded off by the supporters. For what? He's basically cost his team any chance of getting back into it 
and he gets a standing ovation. Well, maybe they think, maybe they think, you know, he's been a captain over the course of the season. He's done pretty well for them for eight months of it. And yeah, maybe, you know, at the end of the day, showing support for someone rather than hammering them is, is a better way of dealing <laughs> with it. But I'm sure, but I'm sure that, uh, that they are just as frustrated as you clearly are. Uh, because I know that you've, uh, you, you're, you're sort of an Aston Villa lover, aren't you? Because you back them to, uh, to finish above Newcastle United, which I think they probably will do yeah. now, uh, which is why Jim White is hastily going to the coin shop to try and sort of get all those £500 worth that he's going to have to donate to the charity of your choice. Um, but with Tottenham and Ange Postacoglu, they obviously have had these moments where they've They've been absolutely brilliant and startling. And I think, you know, going forward, they, they really are, aren't they? I mean, they've got some great talent. But that, I think Villa played into their hands, really, on, in, in this game. And I, they're not always going to have it their own way like this. But this is a good day and they should celebrate it, Kev. 100%. I, I thought it was a really weird game in the sense that I thought Villa looked really dangerous in the first half at times. I thought the high line was being exposed at times. Van der Ven was being fully tested with that speed we always talk about. He absolutely needed yeah. that. Uh, and I thought they did look dangerous. And you thought, well, the longer this goes on with that high line, they're going to get Watkins in at some stage. They're going to get Bailey in at some stage. And how are Tottenham going to adjust? Well, they didn't adjust. They just kept on playing the way they play. But what they did was with that incredible press that they've got, which is so well coordinated. You know, I think sometimes when we talk about pressing, people think it's just people running just all the time. Mm. And it is. But it relies on triggers. It relies on work on the training ground. It can't be as good as that if it's not really carefully put together. And that's absolutely what Postacoglu has been able to do in a very short space of time. And it was a triumph for that. And what they do have is really clinical players in attack. I mean, Son, if you look at his data over the last few years... Oh, his finishing not, is excellent. There is not as good a finisher in world no. football as yeah. him in terms of overperforming his XG. And he's just a sensational footballer. So if you've got that at the top of the pitch, when you've won the ball high up, you're going to win games. So I thought that was a real vindication of everything that Postacoglu has done with that club. OK, uh, talking of XG and overperforming, God, Everton would love to be in that situation. <laughs> they are underperforming by a country mile. In fact, it's such a huge... I think it's nearly touching 20 now, the disparity from what they should have and what they actually do. My word, they have so many chances. And we've talked about it so often. I spoke to Sean Dash after they lost away at Manchester United by two goals to nil. And I said to him, it's another one of those days where we're walking out and we're talking about, you know, sh shots on goal, XG, yet you come away with nothing. You know, it can't go on forever. And he went, you know, the, the worst thing about this is it can go on forever because it has been. You know, so December the 16th was the last time they won a game. They were the better side for a lot of this match. Second half, they sort of faded. I think they lost confidence as the game went on. They threw on players to try and win it and it didn't work out for them. So they ended up finding themselves again, sort of toiling a little bit. But they had so many clear-cut chances to win this game. And the two goals they gave away to Manchester United, arguably Manchester United didn't have that many chances, really, were both sloppy penalties. And you know, afterwards, I spoke to Eric Ten Hag and I'm a bit worried about Eric Ten Hag, a little bit concerned about him, because he seems to be telling me the opposite of what I actually see. So I, I know that <laughs> yeah. I know I know that like last week in the game against Manchester City he came out with some interesting statements after that match. The week before he irritated Crook beyond all belief by trying to tell him uh, that uh, they had control and played quite well in the game or something like that, and Crook was going absolutely crazy. And then on Saturday, he said, we defended well. I was, I, was, I was actually gobsmacked because I thought if Liverpool come to town next Sunday and they defend like that, they're going to get whacked five or six. Yeah, it has put me in two minds actually about whether to, uh, <laughs> to attend that game as player and watching Liverpool yesterday and watching United uh, gift Everton a host of opportunities. I think this is a problem for Ten Hag because it's not so much going to be about results. I think they'll probably finish sixth. I, I was just looking at Aston Villa's fixtures there. They've got some tough games, actually, Villa, particularly away from home. So it's, it's, it's not yet out of United's reach, but it is in terms of the performances and the data. And I think yeah. Ineos are going to look at the data. They're going to look at the level of control that United have in matches, even when they win or the lack of. And I think ultimately that will be where 
Ten Hag unravels. He doesn't just need wins between now and the end of the season. He needs an identity and he needs to show that he's capable of putting a team together that can control matches. If you can't control a game against Everton, you're in big trouble. They played like the away team. You know, they, yeah. they sucked up pressure and then hit on the counter, which, by the way, is their best way of operating and has been for five years. That is that is basically what they are built built for. That's that that's the personnel that they have got. Yet they're obviously trying to come away from that, but they haven't got the personnel to do it or the coaching to do it. But the issue is this: you know, the idea of performances is is a, is a big question. But if you go back to the press conference that he hosted, Kevin. On Friday, when he was talking about injuries, and I agree with him, there's so many injuries that they've had in that team, and some of them key, that left-hand side in particular, Shaw Martinez, we recognise it, that's fine. But everyone has had a lot of injuries in this season. For whatever reason, and we don't know the real reasons, but it's going to be something to do with the World Cup and extra games and all sorts, yes, we know. But, but, he said, if he had had all of his players, he would have won 75% of his first 100 games. Yeah. Ridiculous. By the way, if the results had actually reflected all of the performances during the course of this season, they would have lost 75% of their games because they're, the matches, some of the matches they've won this season, they've been second best by a country mile in. And, and, and you've been sitting there scratching your head going, how have they pulled that out of the fire? Brentford, Nottingham Forest, just two examples off the top of my head. I think he's really losing credibility, actually. Um, as a coach because as you say some of the stuff he's been saying in recent weeks has been borderline delusional and when you when you analyze these games you do a mix right so you use the data on one side but you can't completely rely on the data and you use the sight test you use the experience you have in watching games and you say is this team playing well yes with united they're failing on both counts because anybody who's watching them in games knows they're busking some of these wins. They had a great run with Hoyland when he was up front and he was scoring goals and they were running hot and they were winning these games. But you look at the data, there are some expected goals models and expected points models which will tell you they have 11, 10 or 11 points more than they should based mm. on their performances this season. And that's just mm. not one model. That's a few different XG models. There are a few. And you look at their performances and you just think, well, how many games are they dominating? And it's so few. And you're absolutely right about the control thing. And we've talked about this before. If you don't have a clear way of playing, how are you controlling a team? And I think, how are you controlling a game? And I think he's being made to look worse by Postacoglu, by Emery, by some of these guys who've come in to their club. By Gary O'Neill. By Gary O'Neill. And there's always this thing, oh, we need two or three transfer windows to change it all, and he needs time and blah, blah, blah. No, <laughs> O'Neill came in, they got them playing the way he, he wants to play. He had two or three training sessions. Gary exactly. O'Neill went to exactly. Old Trafford and outplayed them. But you saw the shape immediately. Poster yeah. Cogley, you saw the shape immediately. They've done so much better than I thought they would in the opening weeks of the season because traditionally when he takes over, it takes a while for the players to take it on board. Emery, from the get-go, from the moment he arrived, this is how we want to play. This is how I'm going to make you get to where I want you to get to. And they've done it. And they're a bit hit and miss at times, but they're in the mix for the Champions League. I would be gobsmacked, absolutely gobsmacked, if United managed to finish in that top four because that will be one of the greatest statistical anomalies I think we've ever seen in the Premier League <laughs> because they are no good. They are a mid-table team if you look at the data and the performances. It, it is, I mean, they've lost more games than Chelsea have lost this season, which is unbelievable, uh, but it is true. Um, let's uh, just do a couple of sort of technical off-the-field bits and pieces that we need to round up. So we expect, I suppose, we should we do the Liverpool stuff first? Um, Michael Edwards to go back in at Liverpool with Richard Hughes as a technical director. Uh, and those two will be responsible uh, for rebuilding Liverpool. After Jurgen Klopp has gone, they'll be responsible for appointing a manager as well. We, you know, we're lucky enough to know Richard Hughes very, very well because of, uh, you know, we grew up with him in Portsmouth. But uh, also he uh, he's latterly been the sporting director down at uh, Bournemouth. Um, look, I mean, does it change our view as to who might be the next manager of Liverpool, Crook, I suppose, is the first question. 
Um, I don't think so. Uh, Richard Hughes, by the way, uh, most remembered by Liverpool fans for scoring against them for Portsmouth uh, in an FA Cup tie, knocking them out of that competition. So uh, I'm sure they'll forgive him that. Um, I, I think actually the managerial hunt is quite straightforward because there aren't that many elite managers out there. And I think whatever they do, they're going to be taking a bit of a gamble. I'm not sure that Amarim is quite up to it yet. I don't think his body of work uh, would justify such a high-profile position. I think Roberto De Zerbi probably has been a little bit too erratic this season, both on the touchline and with some of the comments that he's made, even about the owners uh, in midweek, which won't have gone down well with Tony Bloom, that I'm not sure they'll take a risk on him. So I think all roads still lead to Jabby Alonso uh, at this moment in time, who happens to have the, the same agent, by the way, as uh, Andoni Ireola who, of course, Richard Hughes appointed at Bournemouth. So that could be quite a, an easy conversation. But even that's a gamble, isn't it? He's done brilliant in the Bundesliga this year. They're going to win the title at Bayer Leverkusen. You have to admire the relentlessness with which they've gone about that. But Liverpool is a whole different ball game. All I would say, when you look at the playing squad, if they can get the most Salah situation sorted and get Virgil van Dijk tied to a new contract with the young players they've got coming through, I don't think the playing squad actually needs that much work. It's yeah, all about just making sure the man in the dugout is right. Yeah, they've inherited a very good situation uh, and they'll make it even better because you know that Michael Edwards, who, again, we've known for a very long time, is, is someone who's very clever uh, at recruiting players, retaining players and building models to, 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 to improve football clubs. Um, but you've, you've, you've come up with a couple of assumptions there. You said Bayern Neverkusen would win the Bundesliga. They are going to win the Bundesliga. Well, they, as Kev will tell you, they're called Bayern Neverkusen for a reason. <laughs> so it can all still go go wrong very quickly there. There's still a few games. How many games to go and how, what's the points differential? So we've got nine left, but they won on uh, Sunday. Um, against Wolfsburg 2-0. So the 10 points clear with nine games to go. I actually think they will win the league. That's not very bold, I know. No. But <laughs> oh, you in, stick in, your neck out there. Yeah, exactly. But look, in years gone by, I'll tell you why, in years gone by, you'd have a situation where you'd look at Bayern and think, well, they could win all nine games and that they, that would put them under real pressure. That's not going to happen. Because I, I did Bayern's game on Saturday. They won 8-1 against Mainz. They didn't play that well. <laughs> which sounds ridiculous because they won 8-1. But at 2-1, they were on the ropes and Mainz came close to an equaliser and then they cut loose second half. But I, I think Harry Kane has papered over a lot of cracks there. Um, you know, he's the first player ever to score four hat-tricks in his first ever Bundesliga season. He's up to 30 now. He only needs one more goal to have the best ever debut scoring season in the Bundesliga from anyone. And without him... They'd be a mess. So I, I, I can't see them putting together the kind of run you'd need to overhaul them. Just on Shabby Alonso, I was, I was a little bit sceptical, even with them having the season they've been having, until they had that game against Bayern a few weeks ago. And I know one game shouldn't shift your view, but it did because he I mean, made really good, bold Rich. selections really bold mm -hmm. selections. He left out a couple of players that played almost every game. He knew exactly what Bayern were going to try and do. And he just thought so carefully about every aspect of it. And if you can do that in your biggest game of the season, that is really quite remarkable. The man management to not lose a single game in any competition. That means you're using a squad properly. He's had players away with AFCON. He's had injuries, you name it. And he's jumped over every single hurdle he's had to deal with. The football will be different if he goes to Anfield. It won't quite be what we saw against City, that kind of really visceral kind of football. But they do work hard and well without the ball. So there'll be elements that Liverpool fans will enjoy and they do play some brilliant slick football. So if he goes there, I think it could be successful. Yep. Um, I think also it's uh, worth pointing out that there might be a change at Manchester United in the summer with Dan Ashworth coming in as the technical director. Obviously, Dale, Dave Brailsford is already there. There could be a place for uh, Doogie Friedman, although I was told at the weekend that might be a little bit wide of the mark. Um, interesting to see how you feel about that, Crook, and what happens with Eric Ten Hag. Is there a scenario that could unfold here where we see Dan Ashworth take over before the end of this season and we see 
at the end of the European Championships, the England manager become the Manchester United boss. Is that possible? Well, I think it's very feasible. Um, they want Ashworth in, in situ as quickly as possible. And we know that he is a, a big admirer of what Gareth Southgate has done with the national team. They have a, a really good relationship. Southgate's also got a good relationship with Sir Dave Brailsford. So I do think there's substance uh, to that interest. Same with Gray and Potter. I think they're probably the two front runners if any of us do decide to make a change. Either one of them is going to be met with an underwhelming response, I think, from Manchester United fans. If you spoke to a lot of United fans and you said you can have Ten Hag, Potter or Southgate, a lot of them would stick with Ten Hag. I think from that trio, uh, you know, I, I'm not definitive that I want to change the manager, but the, the more you see those poor performances, the more you think that maybe that, that the time is right. I would probably go for Potter ahead of Southgate. Um, I think he is misrepresented by what happened at Chelsea. I think when you see that Pochettino has a very different personality, is still struggling to get a tune out of Chelsea. Maybe you have to cut Potter a little bit more slack. I think he, he has got more about him than he showed during his time at Stamford Bridge. I think he can he can mould a team to play with a certain identity and that word keeps coming up. That's what United need. I think he can get the best out of young players. That's also what United need because they haven't got untold riches to lavish in the transfer market despite Sir Jim Ratcliffe coming in. They're very close to the line when it comes to profit and sustainability. I'm just not buying Southgate as an elite level club manager. Yes, he's done well with England, but this is a, this is a whole different ball game. Also, it's not an ideal scenario if they do decide to change the manager that they have to wait until the end of the European Championships to get the new man in place because this is a massive summer for United. They need to hit the ground running. If that is the case, of course, we don't know that it is. It's just one of the many suggestions that have been doing the rounds in the last couple of weeks. We will find out and watch it keenly. Wednesday night, we've got live commentary of Bournemouth against Luton. I think Crook tried to misrepresent me a little bit earlier on and said that I fancy Luton. That's not true at all. Actually, what I said to him you fancy the privately, game. In, and what I said to, to Kev is, is that I do fancy the game. I fancy the game because Luton have a chance. And I think when you're in a situation where you can see that if you were to win this weekend, there is uh, this week, there's a possibility of you dragging yourself out of the relegation zone or at least closing the gap to, so significantly that things will start to flip-flop on a more regular basis. It makes it a tantalising prospect. What we don't want, of course, is Bournemouth to turn up, score three goals in the first 15 minutes and it be a wasted trip down to the south coast. But I'm sure that won't be the case. That's Wednesday Night Live on Talk Sport. Very much looking forward to that. And then, of course, next weekend, the FA Cup quarterfinals. We'll preview them all on Thursday. Uh, so make sure you're with us for that. Crook, thank you very much. Uh, where are you this week? You, you're going to Cheltenham, I take it? Any sort of spurious trips to Portugal just for a laugh? Or No, no, I'm at Cheltenham uh, on Wednesday. Uh, looking forward to that, which is why I won't be joining you at the Vitality, um, unfortunately. And then, uh, yeah, Saturday off, obviously, because the um, reduced Premier League schedule. And then I'm due to be coming up to Old Trafford with you on Sunday. Looking forward to that. No, no worries. Um, <laughs> Kev, uh, you, you got a busy week? Yes, uh, Champions League for me later in the week. Uh, into Ooh. away at Atletico. I'm really looking forward to that. So be co-coms for me on that. And then more Bundesliga at the weekend. So, yeah, always busy. Good stuff. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We'll be back on Thursday afternoon. Premier League All Access podcast from TalkSport returns on Thursday. And of course, uh, all the breaking news continues on TalkSport. Sport.